Hello, good afternoon and welcome everyone uh, to our Monash Migration and Inclusion uh, webinar on hate speech during COVID-19. A really warm welcome to everyone from uh, all corners uh, of Australia here this afternoon and you are warmly welcome. We've uh, all become accustomed to these webinars and it's just terrific to see so many of you uh, here engaging uh, with us. Uh, my name is Sharon Pickering. I'm a professor of criminology and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at Monash, where the Migration and Inclusion Centre is located, along with a lot of other work uh, within the, the faculty uh, that contends with issues of diversity and inclusion. Uh, well, I know that you join us from uh, many of the Aboriginal nations across our country. Uh, I would like to offer an acknowledgement of country uh, on the lands uh, where I am this afternoon. And I would like to pay my respects uh, to the people of the Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation uh, and recognise uh, their elders past, present and emerging. Diversity inclusion is a core concern not just for our faculty but for our university and I know it is a core concern for uh, all of you that come together from other universities who are joining us here today as well as many NGOs, people working with government and people working across a whole range of industries and it's fantastic to be able to come together to concentrate our minds on what that means uh, in this particular point uh, in the pandemic. Hate speech is something that many of us have been concerned with for a long time, but we know that it has um, taken on new and different inflections uh, during this period. And that's really what we want to be focusing in our discussion uh, on today. Uh, so just to give you a sense of how uh, the webinar is going to unfold. Uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, uh, go through a nut, there's going to be a, a, a number of uh, pieces. We're going to uh, have uh, a little bit of housekeeping um, in a moment. Uh, we'll also have an introduction from Matteo, a video from Professor Imran Awan, uh, Professor of Criminology at Birmingham City University. We're going to then meet our panellists who are going to begin our discussion and then we'll be opening to broader Q&A uh, from all of you. So before going uh, headlong uh, into uh, our agenda, I'd like to welcome Chloe Keel. Again, thank her for all of her work in helping to prepare the webinar, and she will ably step us through the housekeeping requirements. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so just a few quick housekeeping matters. Um, so this event will be recorded. I believe you all should have received a notification when you entered the Zoom. Um, Cameras and mics uh, will be off for the duration of the webinar for the attendees, just given the number of attendees. And all questions for the panel can be sent through the Q&A function. Um, so when posting a question, please also state the organisation that you're representing. Um, also a great thing about the webinar functions is that any questions we don't have a chance to address we will have a record of and be able to follow up after the seminar. So if you have a burning question and we don't get to it, we will be able to follow that up with you. Um, and also for those who would like to share any innovation regarding inclusion practices, particularly during COVID-19, uh, please indicate this in the Q&A and I can enable your audio and video during the discussion if you would like to say something. Uh, we're looking forward to an engaging discussion with our panelists and audience on this important issue. So we would encourage respectful and constructive dialogue. So please be mindful of others when making comments in the Q&A and the MIC team will be moderating any comments made throughout today's event. Um, back to you, Sharon. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Chloe. So as I mentioned, we're gonna begin the webinar with a video. Uh, this video is from Professor Imran Awan, criminologist from Birmingham City University, who has research expertise on hate speech and Islamophobia online. The video is titled Coronavirus Fear and How Islamophobia Spreads on Social Media. It's a presentation of findings from a recent research briefing report he prepared on part of the uh, United Kingdom government's anti-Muslim hatred working group uh, with his co-author, Roxana Khan-Williams. So just bear with us and we'll begin the video. 
Hello everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you today all about hate speech. It's such an important topic and has been even more prominence in recent times. Um, when I was first writing about hate speech back in 2013 and prior to that, there was very little detail about it in terms of what were the consequences, what were the impacts, how people cope with it. But it's uh, a real sort of eye-opener for people now, particularly with more academic research coming out there that discusses hate speech and its effects. So that's always a positive, but can always be seen as a negative as well. So my name is Professor Imran Awan. Uh, I research mainly issues around online Islamophobia or Islamophobic hate speech. And as I said, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you, albeit via video link. Um, one thing I want to really stress at the beginning is when we talk about hate speech and hate crime, the effects on communities are all uh, all the much more hardening and, and varied in terms of the different communities that are affected. Um, in the UK, we particularly have seen this rise in anti-Chinese racism and hate crimes against the Chinese community. And this was a really important part of why we wanted to do this project. So myself and my colleague, Ratsana Khan-Williams, were commissioned by the independent members of the Anti-Muslim Hatred Working Group uh, to look at and explore this effect of anti-Muslim hate speech and whether that was having an effect on social media. So we went about trying to explore whether this was happening and what were the key themes that were emerging from it. And so three things really stick out for us. The first is that Muslims were uh, viewed in this lens of being super spreaders of the virus, that for some reason Muslims were purposely going out there to spread the virus. And this really was put in language by a lot of different people, particularly those from the far right, um, who were trying to push this uh, them and us narrative that look, Muslims are not, they don't care about people's well-being, they're still out shopping, they're still out going to places. Uh, such as the mosque. And the mosque brings me on to the second theme really that was mosques are to blame. And there were lots of different theories, particularly conspiracy theories around mosques being still open. And uh, one example I'll, I'll explain to you really is one used by a former far-right member uh, of, uh, well he was a former leader of the English Defence League but still a far-right member, Tommy Robinson, who used a video purportedly showing a, a group of Muslims going outside of a mosque uh, in Birmingham. And the police were quick to debunk it and say, well, actually, this was a long time ago and that the video wasn't relevant today. But it's that type of narrative that's been pushed, particularly by those in the far right, to try and create that them and us narrative, the polarization, which really feeds into this perspective that, uh, you know, Muslims are a threat, uh, ultimately. And finally, uh, another part of the conspiracy theories uh, that were being pushed uh, were that Muslim women were responsible. And I think this does reveal how Islamophobia is highly gendered. So Muslim women, because of their visibility, were being provoked, particularly offline, in shops, uh, being coughed at, being sworn at, and really very, facing the brunt of hate, hate crimes, particularly offline, as well as the hate speech that we were seeing online. And when it comes to Islamophobia, what we sort of understand from it when it comes to hate speech, it has, as I said, various uh, impacts. But interestingly, there was also an international dimension. So whilst we focus primarily on Islamophobia from a British lens, there were clear examples, particularly in India, where the hashtag Corona Jihad had been uh, shared and sort of trending over 300,000 times, depending on which statistics you look at. So that really was again trying to defame and create tensions between Muslims offline. And we found that through stuff that was happening in India, particularly with shops, with Muslims being targeted by lots of Islamophobic hate speech. So there was clearly an international dimension. Now, when it comes to Islamophobia online, uh, one of the key facets of my research has, has been that it's been triggered by what I call, uh, in effect, flashpoints or trigger events. Things like COVID-19 being a classic example, or terrorist attacks. And this was again an example, as soon as we saw a, uh, a particular incident like COVID-19, there was an escalation when it came to Islamophobia. And uh, whether that happens offline when those incidents are not there is again something where more research needs to be done. But particularly when there is a trigger event, we see this specific rise or spike 
in hostility. And what can we do about hate speech, uh, things like Islamophobia and other forms of hate speech online? I think it's really important that uh, social media companies, that we work with them, and social media companies take an active role. In Britain, for example, uh, organizations like Twitter uh, have taken, and Facebook have taken a really active step in banning uh, people like uh, Tommy Robinson and groups like Britain First. And that's one part of tackling hate speech is removing uh, a platform that gives these people the, this amplification for hatred. Um, that's one part of it. But the other part is really education and working with local schools at a very younger age with children to try and get them to understand the dangers of hate speech, the dangers of social media. So there's lots and lots more to do. And uh, as any academic would say, if you are interested in further uh, looking at this type of stuff, particularly around Islamophobia, you can refer to some of my previous research. My books around Islamophobia has gone viral, uh, published by Routledge, and my publication in the British Journal of Criminology that looks at online and physical uh, anti-Muslim hatred. So please do have a look at for those. Once again, uh, I'm delighted to talk to you. It's a real privilege and an honor and thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Uh, I'm sure we all found that really interesting from Imran and of course those uh, mentions at the end as to where you can follow up on where some of that research uh, can also be found and we'll also provide some links to the reports uh, that he referred to. I'm now delighted to be able to introduce you to one of my colleagues at uh, Monash. Dr. Matteo Bonotti is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations in the School of Social Sciences at Monash and he's a member of the Monash Migration and Inclusion Academic Network. Matteo's research interests, and I, I will read these to make sure I don't leave any out, include linguistic justice, free speech, political liberalism, food justice, and the normative dimensions of partisanship. These all come together and coalesce around an underlying theme of ethical pluralism and cultural diversity in our contemporary societies, and indeed how the state should be responding to them. So without further ado, I will hand over to Matteo to make his presentation. Thank you very much, Sharon. So there should be some slides shortly. And thank you again to the Monash Migration and Inclusion Center for the wonderful organization of this event. So this uh, short presentation is based on a research brief uh, that I prepared with my colleagues, uh, Catherine Bernier and Joe Collins Hall. Uh, so in this brief presentation, we just cover some key issues that can be found in the academic literature on hate speech, looking both at uh, how a speech is understood in different jurisdictions, and what kind of arguments are used for and against its regulation, especially in the political theory and philosophy literature, but also what the, ca the causes and triggers of hate speech are. So if we start to, um, to look at the uh, hate speech, uh, at the different ways in which it is understood in different countries, and, and please close, uh, you can move to the next slide. Um, we, we can see, thank you. Uh, first of all, I mean, the, the premise of this presentation is that uh, there's been an increase in incidence of hate speech uh, in Australia and beyond. And, and as Professor Imra Awan just explained, you know, the targeted groups are uh, not only people of Chinese or East Asian background, but also Muslims, Jews, and others. So this is a very uh, significant problem at the moment in Australia and beyond. So the, on the next slide, we're going to look at um, the, the various ways in which a speech is understood in comparative perspective. So Professor Catherine Gelber will be later uh, able to discuss the more conceptual and normative aspects of a speech. So here I limit myself to illustrate it a, a number of different ways in which laws regulating hate speech understand hate speech in different jurisdictions. Uh, in some countries we find um, legislation that targets hate speech understood as a denial of human rights. You now there have been cases where for example, in a workplace, a white only sign is put outside the door of a, of a bathroom or a restroom. It has been understood as a way of denying you know, the, the human rights and the right to non-discrimination of employees. There are also instances of what is called expression-oriented speech, which includes, for example, cross-burning, targeting African-Americans in the US or fighting words, uh, kind of hate speech that incites immediate 
and often violent reaction by uh, the audience or by the target. Uh, of course, many uh, laws, um, the regulated speech focus on speech that stereotypes and stigmatizes members of certain groups. And in some cases, it targets group defamation, so defamation of members of vulnerable groups. There's also speech that targets people uh, and victims' dignity, which may be understood as human dignity or, in some cases, a civic dignity, so the social standing of uh, individuals as members of society, of a political community. And the latter argument has been advanced, especially by Jeremy Waldron. And, and then, of course, there are laws that target incitement to hatred, such as the UK Racial and Religious Hatred Act, uh, which was devised and introduced in 2006 just to target a specific instance of hate speech. Um, so, on the next slide, we are going to um, uh, to look briefly at some uh, arguments used by defenders of hate speech laws. There's, a, there's an ongoing debate in political theory and philosophy, in legal theory, about whether hate speech should be regulated and if so, why. And defenders of regulation normally uh, argue that hate speech causes harm, uh, even though they disagree regarding what kind of harm is relevant uh, to the justification of hate speech laws. So some, some people, some authors, argue that hate speech may cause physical harm, not short-term physical harm, not resulting from incitement to hatred, for example. Uh, others focus more on the climate of hatred, which may emerge over time as a result of a speech um, filling the atmosphere of a society. And this might result in injustice and discrimination against members of vulnerable groups over time. Uh, other people, other authors uh, argue that hate speech can cause health conditions uh, on their targets, including high, high blood pressure, for example, or also psychological harm, various forms of uh, you know, anxiety, depression, and so on. Uh, and other authors focus on uh, assaulting people's self-respect and dignity. Uh, and this goes back to the point I made earlier about Jeremy Waldron's argument about uh, hate speech undermining citizens, certain citizens' uh, civic dignity. But then on the next slide, we can see that uh, the debate, of course, also involves um, those who oppose hate speech legislation. Uh, there are many liberal thinkers and others who think that however bad hate speech is, it should still be allowed in a society. Some of them argue, for example, uh, referring especially to the work of uh, the British philosopher John Stuart Mill, that hate speech, however bad it is, it helps us to discover the truth. All speech helps us to discover the truth in a society. We need to have a free circulation of ideas, a marketplace of ideas in order to um, formulate true opinions, to, to, to reach the truth in different areas, politics, morality, science, and so on. Others appeal to the importance of uh, speech for individuals' autonomy, both as speakers and as members of the audience. We should be allowed to say whatever we want because that's a way for us to express our autonomous agency, or as members of an audience, uh, to be exposed to as much information as we can in order to formulate uh, beliefs, to, 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 yeah, to, to believe certain things and to act based on the beliefs that we formulate. Uh, and finally, many others, and uh, this is probably the most influential argument uh, nowadays against uh, hate speech laws, many others argue that uh, a speech, like all other speech, contributes to democratic debate. It helps people to participate in public deliberation about legislation. It helps people to hold their representatives accountable and so on. So if we hinder, if we regulate a speech, we are going to undermine this important democratic good. Needless to say, for each of these arguments, there are many others who argue that actually the discovery of truth, our individual autonomy, democratic debate might actually be hindered if we have a speech in society, for example, because uh, a speech may sometimes silence members of certain groups and therefore may exclude them from democratic debate. So democracy loses in this way rather than gaining from a speech. Uh, now moving on to the next uh, slide, we can see the uh, another important area of reflection in the literature on a speech concerns not so much the effects of a speech, not so much the arguments for or against regulation, but um, the analysis of the causes of its speech. So this is social science literature, social and political psychology literature that has looked extensively at the causes and triggers of its speech. A very influential model in this literature is uh, provided by Robert Stenberg's Flotsam model, where Flotsam is the acronym for the various causes of hate speech that, as you, can, as you can see in this slide, 
standard things are crucial to the rise of hate speech. And when some, at least some of these features are present, uh, hate speech is likely to manifest itself in a society. So fear, of course, fear of strangers, fear of uh, uh, unknown situations that one is not prepared for often leads to uh, an increase in his speech. License often granted by certain leaders, uh, which make people believe that they can use no, uh, um, hate speech against members of certain groups, increases the likelihood of people actually using hate speech. Obedience to authority, trust are also key factors. And here trust uh, can be understood as trusting one's simplicity can often float thinking and understanding of a situation, understanding of other groups and so on. Identity and sense of belonging are, of course, crucial to um, um, the factors uh, that contribute to hate speech, as we already know also from theories such as social identity theory in social and political psychology. Uh, leaders can often also amplify the arousal present within the public and therefore contribute with the rhetoric, with their speeches to increasing the likelihood of a speech. And finally, the degree to which people model and imitate uh, their behavior uh, by following other people also can be a factor in the rise of speech. So a combination of these factors can be crucial for uh, you know, the rise of speech, uh, including during times of crisis. And on the next and final slide, we're going to look briefly at how in times of crisis, uh, there can be various triggers that can lead to an increase in hate speech, even when a speech is already present in a society. Uh, and there can be an increase in the overall amount of a speech, but also sometimes a change in the targets uh, of a speech, as we may be witnessing perhaps now during COVID-19, where there's been many, a lot of anti-Chinese uh, anti hate uh, speech in Australia and beyond, for example, um, more perhaps than a few years ago. Uh, so there are different types of crises which may trigger a speech or increase the level of speech. And uh, financial crises, of course, uh, can be um, moments in which uh, people feel insecure uh, and they, they feel insecure about the future and their children's future, for example, and, and that may trigger uh, an increase in hate speech. But also uh, periods of transition or political transition uh, after the fall of a repressive regime, for example, might also lead to an, uh, a rise in hate speech. So that's what some of the literature tells us. Terrorist attacks, of course, can be key triggers of hate speech. And the UK really, uh, Racial and Religious Hatred Act was introduced in 2006, partly uh, because of the rise in Islamophobia uh, in the UK after 9-11 uh, and after the 7 July bombing. Um, shock and trauma more generally can, cre can increase a speech. Uh, and also the kind of narratives that are often used by politicians, political leaders following um, key events, key trigger events, can also play a key role. When politicians, for example, start to introduce you no know, as and them narrative, that is likely to really uh, lead to a rise in hate speech against certain groups. And so can a narrative which appears, for example, to uh, uh, terms like a crusade as after 9-11 in the US and elsewhere. Uh, and this shows how the narratives can be powerful tools that politicians and others can use in order to uh, incite hatred or at least create the conditions in which hate speech is likely to, uh, to increase in a society. Um, so thank you very much for now. Uh, I'll let Sharon introduce the, our next panelists. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Matteo. And there's so much in there that really does connect some of the uh, mundane and ordinary aspects of hate speech, which sit and bubble under the surface and the times of crisis bring out into the light in such more stark ways. And I'm sure our panelists are going to talk more about that. So I, um, I have a great pleasure now to be able to introduce our panelists. We're, we're joined by four panelists in order to be able to discuss the, the video and uh, Matteo's presentation, and then more broadly uh, explore the topic today. The first is Professor Kath Gelber from the University of Queensland. She's head of the School of Political Science and International Studies at UQ, a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences Australia and a former ARC Future Fellow. Kath has an international reputation. It's downplayed here. It says she's got some expertise. She has a, a very significant international reputation in the freedom of speech and speech regulation. Uh, she's led new 
numerous research projects into the operation of hate speech laws and the effects of counterterrorism policies on the freedom of us freedom of speech. She's joined by Ms. Erin Chu, who founded the Asian Australian Alliance back in 2013 as a way to include Asian Australian voices in the mainstream and create a platform for change. She's a social entrepreneur, fr freelance writer and social activist who focuses on issues impacting on the Asian diaspora. Currently, her organisation is running an Australian-wide COVID-19 racism incident survey, which has garnered close to 400 responses thus far in Australia. And again, uh, we will be sure to make sure that we provide you links uh, with, uh, with Erin's work so you can participate in that uh, further. We we're also joined by Ms Vivian Nguyen. Uh, she's the chairperson of the Victorian Multicultural Commission, uh, an, organiser, an organisation which we know is dedicated to advocating for and supporting multicultural communities in Victoria. She's a passionate advocate for diversity and multiculturalism, multiculturalism with more than 25 years experience in the corporate, public and community sectors. And finally, um, we you are joined by Mr Chin Tan, Race Discrimination Commissioner with the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, Chin Tan commenced his term as Race Discrimination Commissioner uh, in October 2018. Prior to this time, he spent three years as the Director for Multicultural Engagement uh, at the Swinburne University of Technology here in Melbourne, and prior to that, four years as Chairperson and Statutory Head of the Victorian Multicultural Commission. So a very warm welcome to our uh, panellists this afternoon. So first, Kath, let me talk, uh, let, let me turn to you first, if I, if I may. So Matteo has introduced us uh, uh, to a number of ideas around hate speech. But of course, one of the key areas that people sometimes stumble with and, you know, uh, uh, try to are not, is really what we're talking about offensive speech or is it something quite different uh, to that? And then once we make sense of what those two things are or are not, where are we in Australia in terms of its current regulation? And how would you assess where we are at the moment? Thank you, Sharon. And thank you very much for the invitation to participate today. It's great to be here. Uh, so on the first question of what hate speech is, it's really unhelpful actually that it's called hate speech <laughs> because the term hate speech implies that the central defining idea or central defining concept in hate speech is the expression of hatred or, or dislike towards somebody. And actually that's not what it means at all. Certainly in law, that's not what it means, but also in the literature, in the philosophical literature, it's not what it means. What we tend, what hate speech tends to be under, or ought to be understood as is an act of discrimination that happens through words. Um, so it amounts to much more than hurt feelings or offence. It's not, not to be equated with having your feelings hurt. It's not to be equated with simply being offended. It's an act of discrimination that happens through words. And there are a lot of um, elements to whether it's possible to enact discrimination through words. Firstly, we know it's, it's possible to do all kinds of things with your words. If somebody knocks on the door of your house and you don't say, come in, and they walk in anyway, then certainly they have violated a moral code, if not also a legal code. And the only way that you gave them permission in that scenario was verbally. So we know that we can give permission, we can adjudicate, we can judge, we can name, we can marry, we do all kinds of things with our words. So of course we can also harm with our words. So the first component in understanding hate speech properly is to understand that it's a form of harm, as Matteo expressed. And the, I think the neatest way to understand that is that it's a form of discriminatory harm that discriminates against people in much the same way as any other act of discrimination. And that is reflected in the fact that at least the civil laws around hate speech in Australia and in other places are very much located within anti-discrimination law. So uh, context matters in someone's ability to enact or to use hate speech in a way that is capable of harming because the hate speech is capable of harming in the manner I've identified when it occurs within a context within which the targets of that speech are subjected to systemic marginalisation and discrimination and therefore the words have that capacity to enact that kind of harm. So Australia recognises this. We've had a range of both civil and criminal laws prohibiting uh, hate speech since, uh, since for 25, 30, for over 30 years, although they've been enacted at different times in different jurisdictions. There are two primary models in Australia. The first one is the Commonwealth model, and that's the 
I guess you could describe it now as the infamous section 18C, um, which says that is an offence to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate somebody on the ground of their race. Now, this also can contribute to the confusion because there are two words in there, I think, that are particularly problematic in light of what I just said, the word offend and the word insult. Luckily, we don't actually have a problem with that in Australia because courts have interpreted this provision to suggest that the conduct needs to be thought of in terms of the phrase as a whole, that is all of them together, offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate, and the conduct needs to amount to a substantive public harm to be actionable. So even though the word offend and the word insult both appear in Section 18C, that's not how it operates. It operates to, uh, to uh, be applicable to matters that are significantly harmful in the manner that I've outlined. And then a number of states have the model that is used in New South Wales, Queensland and the ACT, which um, is, an, is an inciting hatred provision. And so it's an offence or it's an unlawful conduct, I mean, to incite hatred towards serious contempt for or severe ridicule of a person on a specified ground. So that, they're two very different models. The Commonwealth model focuses on the experience of the target and a state, the dominant state model focuses on the incitement of hatred among the audience. So they're two very different approaches to the same problem. And luckily in Australia, uh, depending on where you live, you often get a choice of which one of those provisions you would like to use. That's great. Thanks, Kath. If anyone ever wanted a five minute masterclass in Australian hate speech, that's that is what you just that is what you just had. Let me turn to Erin because you're undertaking something pretty exciting at the moment, Erin. Together with colleagues, you've created the COVID-19 coronavirus racism incident report. Could you maybe introduce us a little bit more yep. to that, what it's doing, what you're hoping to achieve? Yep. Um, thank you, Sharon, and thank you for and everyone for inviting me today to um, share um, you know, about our survey. So the COVID-19 Coronavirus Racism Incident Report is a survey um, which is a combination of 13 multiple choice questions and seven qualitative questions. Um, so this um, survey is done in collaboration um, with uh, my group, Asian Australian Alliance, and with um, Osman Chu, who is a research fellow at the per capita think tank. Um, and we have um, partners um, to our survey, which are Democracy in Colour and Diversity Arts Australia. So um, we use SurveyMonkey um, as the platform to, um, I guess, generate the survey. And we officially launched or you know, opened the survey to the public on April 2nd this year. And to date, so I just looked at the results today, we are almost at 460 reports of COVID-19 related racism incidents in Australia. And the idea for this survey was it actually started with a discussion between myself um, and with Osmond. And we discussed um, some of the articles that were coming out, particularly impacting on Asian Americans. Um, and they also have a survey which is called Stop AAPI Hate Campaign. So API for those who don't know stands for Asian American Pacific Islander. And that was done and that was coordinated by the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council in the US. And to date, which I just did some research, has recorded um, over 2,000 reports of um, COVID-19 related racism against Asian Americans in the US. So um, after that, we had our discussions with our partners who helped do a lot of the promotion and advocacy around the survey. And one of the main purposes of us actually um, doing this survey is to track um, key patterns and trends and basically prove beyond anecdotal evidence um, that COVID-19 racism was not just, um, you know, cheap talk or just, you know, people saying that it's happening. Um, you know, we have seen even before the survey was launched quite a number of reports on social media, um, particularly on Twitter, um, you know, people kind of talking about um, some racist incidents. I do remember, I, um, I think a doctor in one of the hospitals mentioning that um, early on a patient uh, refused care from her because she was Asian and she could have the virus. So we saw all these things, but we still thought it was really important and critical to have um, statistics, um, you know, to kind of back up that um, anecdotal um, evidence and you know the idea that people know it exists but to have those results were extremely important 
Um, and so, and also a tool where Asians and Asi Asians in Australia and Asian Australians could actually share their experience experiences confidentially, and also not feel that they're alone. Um, I guess in this fight and you know the trauma that they uh, receive because. It doesn't matter the severity of the incidents that you experience in terms of racism. It's all quite traumatic and a lot of people feel alone. So in this way, um, you know, it was a way for them to, to know that they can contribute um, to something, you know, that um, will become a report. And as um, some of you may have attended, even some of the attendees may have attended, we have already um, released our preliminary report, which actually tracked the first two months um, of our um, survey being open. So basically from April 2nd to June 2nd. Um, and that is on our website, AsianAustralianAlliance.net, um, as well as a recording um, from our launch. So if we have time, I'm happy to share some of the key results as well later on. That's great, Erin. I mean, maybe you could actually just talk us through some of those okay. key findings. I've had the benefit of being able to flick through some of that preliminary report and you do see quite a number of different um, incidents in terms of their type and uh, indeed their location and uh, we see again the public space being a significant space mm. in terms of people's victimisation there. Great so yeah I'll share some of the key results actually from the actual survey as I said um, it, it spans from that two month period, April 2nd to June 2nd. And so I guess some of the alarming, but also the key results is that over 65% of the respondents identified as female. And if we think about that, um, are we surprised or are we not surprised? I would say we're not surprised that, um, you know, Asian slash Asian Australian females were, you know, prim primary targets of a lot of these racist attacks. Um, also, the most common type of racism reported, um, I guess, you know, in terms of hate speech was in the form of racial slurs and name calling. And that recorded around 35%. So that basically involves people being called, you know, the usual stuff, you know, coronavirus, you know, being accused of eating bats, dogs, whatever, told to go back to China and all those type of slurs that, you know, that we, a lot of us are quite familiar with. And then if you add verbal threats, so verbal threats are probably slightly more serious in terms of, you know, quite more intimidating than say just, you know, someone just driving by and just yelling something out. That um, amounted to 9.2%. You know, it's quite a huge percentage, you know, almost half of the incidents reported um, actually involve some type of hate speech. And that's only within the first two months of us opening a survey. And if we add in, say, physical assaults, that's about 6.1%. Um, and then people getting spat, sneezed, or coughed on, that's about 8%. Mm. That adding all those is almost 60% of all incidents. Mm. And I guess the final statistics that I'll point out is that, and this wasn't in a report, but I did kind of, um, we'll put that in our final comprehensive report later on, is that in terms of, I guess, cultural background, the majority um, it was um, or is um, some kind of Chinese background. So from the from either from mainland China or from the Chinese diaspora, or, or you know, and in that that's almost half, so fifty percent. And then the second highest was um, those from a Korean background, and then the third was a Vietnamese background, and then Filipino background. And we also had. Um, um, a small percentage, but still quite a number of those coming from a South Asian background um, who said that they too um, faced, um, you know, COVID-19 racism. So if you think about it, it's not just those who are Chinese background, East Asian looking. We've, see, we, we've seen results coming from those who had come from a Southeast Asian background, but also of a South Asian background. So it actually does impact on the whole spectrum or a, quite a wide spectrum of what we consider, I guess, Asian background in that sense. Thank you. No, many, many thanks for that, Erin. That's uh, it, it's, uh, uh, really uh, insightful and I'm sure we'll want to come back to some of those points again. But it actually gives me a, a, an important segue um, uh, to ask you, Vivian, you know, in terms of your work with the, uh, the Commission, I mean, clearly we have seen a targeting around those of uh, Asian identity and origin, but it would be interesting to hear your perspective as to 
how far you see it going beyond those groups into other groups um, that may have been targeted, both Asian and indeed non-Asian. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon, and uh, hello to all of the panellists and uh, everyone of you, wherever you are in uh, this state and this country. Look, for the, from the Victorian Multicultural Commission's perspective, um, racism is something that has always existed. And in Victoria, in particular, we have been seeing some underlying trends of some of the factors. This was before COVID-19 that could um, take us to a, a, a higher percentage of the completely disengaged, according to the Scanlon Social, uh, found a, a, a social Report. So we knew about the, this, this issue. We saw that absolutely amplified in COVID-19, starting out with the uh, Jewish community, where the conspiracy theory was that word, it came from some Jewish person somewhere in the world. Um, and then it uh, hit Australia and Victoria with the Chinese community, you know, and, and it was really great that the, China, the members of the Chinese community and you know, the different organisations in that community, the broader Chinese community, really came together and really, you know, so to speak, sorted themselves out in the, in the early part of January and February this year. Um, and then we move on to uh, a lot more of the incidents and all of these reports that, that Aaron has mentioned, and we see that um, playing out in public places, shopping centres, um, um, uh, public uh, areas and, and on the streets. Um, starting with Asian, anyone who looks Chinese, and, and many is of the, uh, the the cultural groups that Aaron has mentioned, uh, uh, my my own sister included, uh, who have uh, experienced this sort of uh, incidents over the last few months. But now in Victoria, we are seeing more uh, it, of it playing out uh, with the Muslim community. Um, we saw that in um, a little bit of that in uh, around early in April when um, tragically we had that four deaths of the uh, Victoria police officers by a sick uh, truck driver. And uh, through the VMC's multi-faith advisory group, we have uh, received reports from the sick faith community leaders that some members of their community have also been targeted as well. It's quite a contrast for that particular community because on the one hand, we see the sick volunteers everywhere. Every time we see a crisis, we see the Sikh faith members providing volunteer food. Everywhere you go, you see that. But on the other hand, they still experience that, that sort of underlying racism if something um, uh, unfortunate occurred. Over the last few weeks, it's moved on since May to the Muslim community. Um, and they've been blamed for because of their uh, you know large family size or you know there's religious celebrations and things of that nature. And it's it's been quite um, insidious uh, because, you, as we know, the Muslim faith covers many communities. And so we're seeing greater tensions um, in the broader multicultural communities. And that is one that is becoming a, a lot more complex now for us to be able to look at and to try and understand. Um, and, and thinking about these strategies and the approach to be able to support communities, better understand uh, what it is that they're doing or saying, and how is it that the media plays that role, or some, some section of the media, who, who played a, a significant role in influencing young people's perspective about uh, uh, freedom of speech, about conspiracy theories, about this blame game uh, approach, um, and things of that nature. We're seeing that, and, and deliberately um, uh, playing one community against another, um, uh, in, in terms of this social cohesion that we're trying to achieve here in, in Victoria and in other parts of the country. It's complex. Uh, it existed before COVID-19 and it is certainly worsening here during this pandemic. And I think we really need to uh, put all efforts to make sure that at least the work that has been done uh, for year, uh, over the past years, at least we, we are not going backwards. At this very moment, having been on the ground at the Flemington North Melbourne housing estates from the lockdown happened right through to working across the different government departments today, pessimistic today, unfortunately. On that note. <laughs> I know. Today, uh, the, uh, I'm 
sure many people around Australia brace for the morning news conferences, but I think Victorians are, are constantly in a brace position. And it was um, it was a it was a very difficult update that we all saw uh, that we all saw this morning because we know that uh, all of those cases and all of those tragic deaths have um, uh, far-reaching uh, consequences. I think uh, what's interesting is your, your comments, Vivian, take me back to Matteo's comments, which really do, I think, um, underscore um, the link between blame and threat that sits within a deep racial um, history um, that, we are, that we are living and that COVID is indeed part of. Let me now turn to, to Mr Chintan, the Race Discrimination Commissioner for the Australian Human Rights Commission. Now, it's a, it's a difficult task at the Human Rights Commission at the best of times. And of course, one of the most difficult aspects, I imagine, of your role is not only to be uh, constantly witnessing uh, the lives that are impacted by systemic uh, racism, but also moments of crisis and the racism that that ensues, but actually balancing the tension for the Commission between uh, protecting and regulating free speech. And I wonder if you'd be willing to talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, sure, no, thank you. Not at all. I mean, some people think I've got one that pose this job in the world. Yeah, policy, bureaucratic wonk, um, getting a, keeping a job at a time when people are losing their jobs, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but you're right, it's, it's, it's very much a complex issue. Now, looking at the question that you posed to me about balancing um, hate speech and regulations, um, I thought, well, that's an easy one uh, for a lawyer. Uh, you know, it's a simple legal question. I don't have to deal with the problems that uh, the the previous uh, speakers have to deal with. Uh, but uh, let me get to that, that, that framework first. But again, I, I wish to acknowledge as, as you did, Sharon, the traditional custodians of land, which I've gathered here, the, the Wurundjeri and Burong people, uh, and, and pay my respects to the others, past, present, and future. Uh, within the human rights framework, um, there is no overarching right that uh, trumps all other rights. And all rights are balanced together and balanced with the responsibilities that come with living in both a functioning democracy and a cohesive society. And as the Race Discrimination Commissioner and the uh, Australian Human Rights Commission, more broadly, we looked at the individual circumstances of incidents to identify how best to manage the competing rights. Uh, as a case in point, you look at the uh, what has been done uh, with the Racial Discrimination Act 1975, um, it is Section 18D that sets up the exemption where free speech is balanced against uh, prote about protection from discrimination. Uh, and Catherine has done a great job uh, in, in doing an expose about Section 18C, but 18D uh, provides the underlying balance to the legislative framework about rights of people to make uh, speeches that may be deemed from that perspective of a wider definition of hate speech or matters or expression that may be deemed to be uh, hurtful. And, and this includes obviously what is said in public that's reasonable and in good faith, uh, the artistic uh, you know, license to, uh, and, and academic publications and as such. So there is a capacity under the act itself to provide for some understanding about that balance about expectations of communities, about uh, that larger public interest of what people can and can't say. Uh, and the section obviously delivers some guideline on how we can compete these balancing interests to ensure that the freedom to express beliefs and views are not hindered, but at the same time uh, to allow people who in fact might be victims of uh, very hurtful expressions the protection they need I think the Australian courts have historically uh, interpreted uh, Section 18C and 18D in a fair and responsible, reasonable manner and with the public interest in mind. So like Catherine has said, we've done very well in managing that balance to our system in terms of both the community, in terms of the government, in terms of the court system. But in regard to freedom of speech during the COVID 19 pandemic, uh, I, I'm concerned by the relative lack or the absence of narratives 
whether that be in the media or within the community generally, that seeks to counter the increasing and strident incidents of hate and malicious speeches and expressions which we have witnessed in recent time. So I'm also concerned about the lack of diverse representation of those who have access to a platform to share their views. I don't believe that the current political and media narratives have given us enough weight to the voices of multicultural Australians. We don't see multicultural issues analyzed from the perspective of those who are affected most, those communities themselves. And I'm very grateful for what Aaron is doing and, and being one of the first to have come out and, and done a survey in the form that she has done to give us more information. And we're using that information in a very constructive way towards forming and, and formulating policies as well. So the diversity is important to provide a well-rounded understanding of the experiences of all Australians and to combat the fake news and the hate speeches and commentaries that we are seeing more and more. And indeed, I've been urging Australian media to improve the representation of diverse views during this time. And I'm pleased to see that many have done that. I'm also quite shameful that some of the breakfast shows haven't followed suit. Now, I've been advocating for a special standard of reporting on multicultural communities similar to what exists for reporting on domestic violence. And I'd like to see this as a major project sitting under a refreshed or reframed national anti-racism strategy, which we are working on currently, hopefully with government support. If not, we'll be running it in consultation with community at large. So in essence, and I'll finish on this quickly, uh, there are no protected rights to hate, and certainly there are no rights as such entitling people to make hate speeches. The freedom of opinion and expression is a freedom to express freely, which is not the same as a sanctioned freedom to express hate or incite hate, contempt for and violence against another. Freedom of opinions and expressions is always tampered and balanced against other freedoms and rights. So I'm going to leave it there, otherwise I'll be talking for the next two hours, Sharon. Thanks so much, Jim. Can I just encourage everyone to um, contribute their questions or comments via, via the Q&A function so they can be fed through to me here. Let me start by opening up to the, uh, by opening up to the panel and ask a, a question that's coming in a couple of, in a couple of different forms already. And that is, do you see something different happening at the moment? Is the hate speech that we're witnessing during COVID, is there something distinctive about it? Is it an amplification of what we've seen before or is it a break? Is it a shift? Kath, do you want to take a, a, a first turn at that? Certainly. So I think what's different uh, so in, in some senses, I certainly agree with things that Erin and Viv and Chin were saying, racism's been with us for a very long time, hate speech has been with us for a very long time. The targets change according to the latest political uh, event or the latest trigger event. I think what is different right now is the state of global politics. And the state of global politics is such that it has undermined the capacity of people like us to make evidence-based arguments because we're in this phase where truth doesn't matter, what matters is what you think. Um, we're also in a social media age, um, but we're also very much in an age where global politics is uh, sanctioning, where there are very important world leaders, including the President of the United States and the President of Brazil and others, who either overtly or impliedly are sanctioning some really quite uh, extreme um, uh, expressions and ways of expressing oneself that even five years ago probably would have been far less acceptable on the political stage. And so I'm firmly of the view that things do change. I don't believe in that proverb, people will never change. People do change, they change all the time and they can change in a way that makes them more, um, more open to diversity and multiculturalism and inclusion and they can change in ways that make them less open to those things. And I think that the global political situation we're in now is sanctioning a virulence mm. and, and giving people 
backup, giving people the feeling that, well, if world leaders are saying these things, then surely I can say them too. So I think it's a particularly dangerous time because there's a sanctioning and there's an, there's an approval from certain quarters that gives these kinds of incidents a force that they wouldn't otherwise have. Mm. And Kath, I think um, to extend your point, not only are they giving it a permission, but of course they've now got a really extensive mechanism to be able to turn up the volume uh, on both their explicit and implicit messaging. And here I'm talking about the media. And we've got a, a question here from Amar Singh, who's president for uh, Turbans uh, for Australia. And he's asked specifically about what role has the media played in heightening hate speech during COVID-19. Matteo, perhaps I could come back to you on that one and seek your views. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, I think uh, when it comes to the media, I mean, if we go back to the to the issue concerning you know, the, the the various factors uh, that may contribute to a, a rise in a speech, you no, know, the issue of license, for example, that I mentioned is highlighted by Robert Sternberg, is certainly important. This is linked to, to what um, Catherine was saying just now. Uh, we we may think certain things, but uh, social norms and social stigma may. Um, be able to control you know, what we think we are allowed, uh, legitimized to say in the public sphere. Now, that sort of social stigma maybe is decreasing, you know, because if the media, for example, are contributing to legitimize certain forms of speech, people feel more legitimized to speak in a certain way themselves. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's quite significant. And some in, in the political theory literature, I would like to add, uh, some authors have addressed this point by saying that, okay, if we have a speech, uh, regulation through law it's one way of targeting but that comes at certain costs in terms of human rights a right to free speech uh, as Jim will say another way is by using counter speech so the state itself could use counter speech you now campaigns uh, through, through the media for example in order to speak against a speech without silencing his speech I think that's a view that's taking um, it, 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 it's, a, it's acquiring prominence in the literature because it's a sort of compromise between silencing its speakers without silencing speech entirely really. It's about countering rather than silence. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the media could play a key role in this with the, aid, uh, with the help of the state perhaps. Uh, uh, so a combination of interventions would be useful. No, thanks Matteo. And that actually is a, is a great segue for me to turn to Viv because I, was, I think there's a question here um, that uh, wouldn't have uh, uh, particular interest uh, for you and, and in terms of uh, your experience. I think that the idea of counter speech is really important. And, and in fact, the question we have is from Peter from Cultural Infusion, who basically is asking us what role can we all play, not just the media, but, but all of us can play in working towards moving language to becoming more inclusive. Look, I, I have no doubt that words are important. Um, we all know that words can kill, and we have, plan we have seen plenty of evidence of that. Uh, the, the challenge here is, I think, the complexity of what's being played out because of the pandemic that sometimes doesn't provide each and every one of us that unified sense that we can speak with one voice. Um, uh, there are tensions amongst different groups of people. Uh, whether it be in age cohorts or whether it be in uh, demographics, whether it be in education, where we live. That in Victoria in particular over the last few weeks. And I think this is where um, the media uh, or certain section of the media can be quite dangerous in the way in which they infiltrate, if I may use that term, uh, small uh, groups on uh, using social media, young people in particular, and because of the pandemic, we so rely on social media to communicate. The legislation uh, uh, around social media is we are not catching up with that, with what's going on there yet. Uh, there are so many loopholes that that allows uh, uh, people who really want to influence our views, they have a free platform to do that. And I think there, 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 there must be something around the, the legislation that really needs to be uh, fast-tracked 
to support the, the, this, the way in which social media is currently uh, being utilized to communicate because of the pandemic. Thanks, Viv. I think one of the things that was uh, that you that you touched on earlier referenced uh, an incident quite early in the pandemic here in Australia, where a person refused treatment in a hospital uh, due to the perceived race or ethnicity of the treating doctor. What we saw in that case was the hospital came out very swiftly and very strongly in support um, of their medic uh, and made a very robust. Um, uh, defence of them and a, uh, a commitment uh, to their to their professionalism, offering, if, if you like, some of that counter talk uh, that we have heard uh, referenced. Bernie has sent in a question here that sort of extends that a little bit further, and perhaps I can I can ask you, Chin, to respond to this. And Bernie's asking, what can our organisations and government do to further combat uh, global politics, uh, seemingly? and too easily sanctioning hate speech. Uh, thanks, Sherrick. Uh, I'm not sure we can do a lot about the international uh, climate we're in. Uh, it's so much uh, conflict and hostility going on. But I want to go back quickly, if I could, Sharon, to take up the first question you had sure. for Catherine. Uh, globalization is, 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 is a big issue, but I think we're living in a very polarized world where extremism thrives on all sides. Um, we're finding it difficult to try and find a nuanced position because everybody wants quick answers and extreme answers. Even for those who are in fact out there seeking uh, to combat intolerance, have employed a lot of intolerance themselves to try and achieve that. And that's the kind of climate we're in where, where we need to have cool heads, the capacity to see through the issues. And I'm not suggesting that the issues out there aren't serious, they are very serious. And as an Asian Australian, I, I see it more than any bureaucrat about the danger it is for a country uh, where we are attacking sections of our communities. But if you look through the whole issues about Chinese being in this country, 160 years ago, the rhetorics were the same. Uh, you know, Chinese were dirty, they were unkept, they were bring diseases and all that. It's been there, it's been there. What's different around now is this. Uh, while racism does not require an excuse, right, for, for, for fermenting the things of hatred it does, what it does in this situation is that there seem to be a lot of excuses for people to do that now, right? And right across, my concern is this, is whether in fact the racism we see now is situational because it's been triggered by something or, or would it linger on? And when it lingers on, where would it take effect? Now, people have spoken about 9-11 and the effect of, on the Muslim community. And I'm doing a current research, well, not research, but a, a project about conversation to Muslim communities. And after 20 years, the Muslim communities are still, in fact, taking the, the, a lot of the brunt from that reason. It hasn't gone away. It's just become normalized that Muslims get victimized on a, on a very casual basis. So in terms of institutions, and I'll get back to this now, is this. Where the racism has occurred with the Chinese community in the last few months, for me, the biggest issues was this. What was the 99% of Australians, what were they doing about this? And for me, there was a lack of that community of program, of the rejection, and the conversations people had in the family homes, or whether in fact they're in the pub with their friends. No one talked about it, and no one was outraged. So there wasn't a community outrage that I wanted to see, because that's important, because that community outrage is gonna shut down the 1% who is in fact misbehaving in this particular way and said, it's not okay. And that message is terribly important important institutions for example what they need to do is this you got to prepare for it not when it happens you can have a culture and institutions that support a capacity to be able to deal with and and combat racism when it occurs and this is where we, we come in to work with institutions about getting it right having a policy and a culture that deals with capacity to deal with racism at any time not because of COVID-19 alone mm. No, thanks, Chin. And I think it's interesting as you uh, as you talk. We've had another question come in that I think actually takes that further when you talk about that 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 one percent. Uh, Susan Carland, one of our colleagues here at Monash, uh, has um, asked that there are recent reports of an uptick 
in far-right activity and that COVID will further exacerbate this. Uh, she specifically asked, how can we preempt this impact, both the potential recruits of the far-right, but also the minority communities who may be their targets? Kath, perhaps I could direct that one to you in the first instance, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Um, no small question, indeed. Um, obviously, there's no magic bullet uh, for, to, for all of this, but there are some things that I would like to see happen in the community that aren't ha happening. Yeah. I guess the first one is much better political leadership. Um, we've heard more about tradespeople in this pandemic than we have about multiculturalism or the importance of combating racism. Uh, we've had remarkably little leadership from our political leaders in this country about the scale of this problem and the, and the magnitude and how important it is to build build well-being. There are there are news there are television ads with songs that sing "We're all in this together," um, but you wouldn't know it from um, the government's response. So I think that uh, better leadership would count for a lot. I also very firmly think that there is greater regulation needed of social media in particular. And not just, um, I don't just mean in terms of taking things down, I mean in terms of really addressing the whole business model on which social media relies. Social media relies on clicks, and in order to get clicks, it's very well known, there's a really great book out there, for example, called Algorithms of Oppression. It's very well known that the algorithms are designed to draw people to, to more and more extreme versions of the views they already hold because that it maximises clicks. I just don't understand why we can't reverse that, why the algorithms can't be written differently so that instead of driving people towards more and more extreme versions, they're driving people to, to better versions of themselves. And, and then the third one alludes to something that Chin just said, which is how important it is to build allies. It's really important that anti-racism uh, organisations and communities seek to work together with other people who are also interested in combating systemic forms of marginalisation, exclusion and discrimination. And sometimes I fear that people are, so, are feeling so frustrated by the current global situation in which we find ourselves that the capacity to build allies um, is, is being put a set aside in favour. Now, I understand people feeling passionately and fervently about decades, if not hundreds of years of systemic discrimination and wanting that to end and wanting it to end now. I absolutely understand that and I'm very sympathetic um, to those kinds of arguments, but I would implore people to work as hard as we possibly can on building allies um, because that's how you move people forward into the direction which is more supportive of inclusion and diversity and multiculturalism as opposed to less. Thanks, Kath. Um, we've got a question here from Joan Pepe from Knox City Council. And Erin, I was hoping you might be able to respond to this because I could an anticipate that this would have come up in the, in the research that you're leading, but also more broadly in the work that you undertake. Uh, Joan's asking, can social media be useful to counter the racist content being pushed um, by places such as Sky After, the, the Sky After Dark uh, crew and on the mainstream media? I think um, social media um, has a, I guess, a positive use, but also a negative use. So in terms of the positive use, use is that with social media platforms, um, people who have a message they want to spread or you want to spread awareness, it can be used um, and it can reach a very, very large audience. So I think it's useful in that sense, you know, in, and we always encourage um, those who have experienced racism, not just um, Asian Australians, um, you know, during COVID-19, but um, all different um, culturally and linguistic um, communities in Australia to kind of raise their voices um, on social media if they feel safe. And I think that question about feeling safe and whether social media is a safe environment is a very valid question because there are people who are willing to share their, those experiences and use their social media voice um, to talk about their experiences, you know, or to um, share videos of things that are going on, you know, in terms of racist incidents that we've seen, particularly on Facebook and Twitter and things like that. And I think that's where social media is um, quite useful. It is also a way um, that we know that news outlets, um, the good and the bad, I guess, 
we're going to put it in um, in that light. Um, they the, they also kind of um, you know go through social media to see uh, what's trending and what's you know something that they want to report on, report on the news. And we have seen a lot of those videos um, that have been taken on public um, on public transport. But also there was that recent one that happened in Adelaide uh, where the um, food de the food delivery driver you know was pretty much just you know hit in the head. Um, pretty much. And um, so these things, you know, have been shared around and um, concerns have been raised as a result of that. But the kind of, I guess, the dark side of social media is that it can also be a very unsafe space for many people. And I think that is also, um, you know, I know that um, particularly, I know Viv kind of touched on that um, earlier about, um, you know, you know, social media also having that kind of negative um, impact in terms of are people, is it safe enough for people to share their experiences? And that's why we say to people, if you are comfortable and you feel safe, then share your experiences. Because the more you can share, the more that issue stays in the mainstream. If we stay silent and don't talk about it anymore or stop, then what happens is that the mainstream um, media, but also the government um, will stop stop caring about that. And that's why, you know, we, you know, I think taking on what um, Catherine was mentioning that, you know, the government has a huge responsibility and also the government um, has a huge role in, um, you know, pushing it, what is actually happening at the moment. So keep it on the radar is extremely important. And for those of us who um, either have social media following, um, but also those of us who are willing to talk about on social media, do it. And it doesn't mean that you have to um, expose yourself clearly and you know people can just share a post um, or comment on something you know and that all contributes to keeping the issue on the mainstream but as long as the air as they feel safe and I think that's an extremely important point. No I, I, I completely agree Erin. Look we've also had questions coming which are really asking for examples of where have we seen uh, organisations or individ individuals craft new or innovative uh, responses to hate speech during COVID? And I guess I'd broaden that even more, uh, even further. If through all of your uh, networks and experiences internationally and locally, are there examples or indications of where this is being done better at the moment? I'm happy to hear from any of the panellists no matter how small or how large the innovations have been? Uh, Sharon, just very quickly, uh, I'll just share uh, just one aspect. Uh, E-safety, for example, our commission uh, responsible for safety on the internet. Um, we, we've worked with them recently and they've actually been very conscious of the need to put on a program that would protect uh, the Asian community, in particular in light of the anti chinese racism. And so we've crafted uh, a initiative that is in the Chinese language uh, that is aimed at the Chinese uh, Asian community at large about how to respond to cyber hate and issues around the area. All right, so it is novel in the sense that the you know, e-safety and the government is actually looking specifically at protecting uh, and being proactively engaging with communities at that level. So for me, that's an important issue. But can I just quickly jump on to, I know, I know I'm know, i I'm probably playing with fire with you uh, because Sharon, uh, you're a very good moderator. But, but in terms of what Catherine has said earlier, and, and she's covered, she covered the field very well, but my concern is this, that in terms of extreme uh, racist extremism, uh, what governments tend to focus on is at the top end of violence. So it becomes an ASIO matter, it becomes an AFP matter. But for me, the, the Brendan Tarrant of this world has been living in our community for years. And, and for me, is when government devote funding of 10 million to one uh, in a police or ASIO like apparatus, they should give another million to us in terms of not just me, but Vip Nguyen, Aaron, and Catherine to do the work of ensuring that we protect communities of the mainstream and prevent the crossover of young people, in particular men, young men who are lost in that system. And that's what it is. And we don't see enough of that because it's always seemed to be a police crime matter. It's not. It is a community problem and needs to be looked at for what it is. 
Well, certainly as a criminologist, Chin, you're not going to get an argument for me in terms of us being able to respond in a much more complex way to both social and criminal harms. But I'll give Kath an opportunity to, uh, to respond and to extend on the points that you've made. Oh, I, I very strongly agree uh, with what Chin said, that community work and community focused work is, is really important and also connecting that to your earlier, earlier point, Chin, which is that the voices of the target groups are muted in this debate and that if, where, where there are community actions, they need to be led by the voices of those who are the targets of these activities. And really, it's, it's the job of allies, of, of us as outlet well, groups, someone like me as an ally, to privilege those voices, to provide the infrastructure and support in whatever way I can, material support in whatever way I can, to put the voices of the targets at the forefront without overburdening the target communities with the whole job of fixing society, right? So that's not fair. We can't expect the target communities to fix everything and it's up to the, up to the community as a whole um, to do this work. So we have to uh, put forward the voices of those who aren't being heard, but in a supported and allied way so that we can all work together um, around these mutually um, goals that we mutually share. Yeah. I would also make an observation, if I may. I think it's, it's the way in which we are wired to deal with issues. We, we tend to come together in a crisis. We respond to a crisis, but in time of, times of peace, we don't tend to invest in issues or in area, in policy areas that are long-term designed to deal with systemic issues because they're not on a burning platform. They're not vote winning. Uh, uh, it, it, it's really difficult. Uh, and, you know, we can say that or oh, the politicians do that, but the politicians in some way reflect the community's views. And so sometimes it is really hard to try and push for something that doesn't have that really burning issue that, you know, unless, until you do this, unless you do this, something's going to happen. And I think that is just the, like, like, that's the way that we are wired to deal with issues in, 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 at least in Australia, in a Western country, is my sense. And we don't spend enough on building this capacity that gradually grows over time. We are, we are short term, we look at things on a short term basis and a two or three year, four year electoral cycle. And those sorts of things reflect uh, the ways that we perceive things as well. Thanks, thanks, Viv. We've got a question here from Turk, uh, Turk and Axoy from, welcome, from Welcoming Cities. And the, questions, the question is really uh, extending upon what uh, many of our panellists have commented upon, which is, you know, hate speech may not be new. And one of the opportunities within that um, within that difficulty is, is there a way for us to look back on what has happened and what responses have worked? So the specific question here is, are there lessons for educational purposes um, to bring back from these previous incidences of hate speech prior to COVID-19 um, that will better equip our communities to support their resilience? Mateo, you touched on some of those earlier ones from around the world. I wonder whether you might like to make a comment on where you think um, some of those examples might come from. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I mean, at the level of education, uh, a lot of emphasis is often put you know, uh, on, on civic education in many countries, if you think about you know, civic education in schools, and this is linked also to things like civic knowledge tests and language tests. There's often an emphasis on teaching citizens what, what, what they share, what unites them, and not to create a cohesive political community. We say that when we approach not immigrants, for example. But I think in all of this, there's often a neglect of not teaching students, for example, pupils in schools, about diversity per se, and how uh, you can have unity diversity in a political community, and how that might involve you know, making children and students aware of uh, how members of different groups may do the things differently. I I'm particularly interested in this from a from the perspective of language, because that's an aspect I work on. It's, it's, it's clear, if you look at, around the world, how language-based prejudice continues to be very widespread, much more than race-based prejudice, even in the mainstream of our societies. It be linked often, and sociolinguists often argue that, to a lack of really education, 
regarding the complex connections between language, identity, uh, and intelligence, and so on. And people often make certain assumptions about people's trustworthiness, intelligence, based on the language they speak or the app. And all of these signals, the fact that uh, if there's a lack of education about you know, the real and the true connections between people's identity, the various aspects of their identity, and, and, and their trustworthiness, intelligence, right? if, if children are not educated from early on about this, they're likely to, to cultivate certain prejudices later on. And this may result in, for example, hate speech. And we rarely talk about hate speech based on language, uh, speech against members of linguistic minorities, but that exists too. So to broaden that to other dimensions of speech, I think it's important to really educate children, not only to civic knowledge and to, to what unites us, but also to what's, uh, what's different in different groups. And that might be a starting point. Thanks, Matteo. I'm conscious of the time, but I'd like to give all of our panelists an opportunity to respond to uh, a single question. And that is, if there is one thing Australia could do nationally right now to better respond to incidents of racism during COVID-19, what would it be? Erin, can I start with you? Um, I think uh, one of the most important things right now is to really push through the um, National Anti-Discrimination um, Initiative um, or strategy um, that's um, already being pushed because it's actually important to start um, looking at um, the legal mechanisms um, where racist incidents um, are, you know, it's not considered, it's actually not, I guess, illegal to be a racist, but looking at how uh, incidents of racism can be made illegal and can be made, um, you know, prosecutable. I think the, 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 this is um, one of the most important things at the moment. Thanks, Erin. Viv, can I go to you next, please? Yeah. Uh, I would have to say it would be visible leadership. Thanks, Viv. We just lost you there for a moment. Could I maybe just ask you just to repeat that again? Because I think we've got you back now. What did I say again? Sorry. <laughs> it was about to say something particularly profound, I thought. <laughs> I think you were saying visible leadership and then we... <laughs> yes, that's right. I, I think it is visible leadership and it, can, it starts with our politicians, our leaders who front up the, the media every day. It doesn't cost us any money. It doesn't require time. It doesn't need preparation and we can do it and we can do it now. That's good. Thanks. Uh, Matteo. Thank you. Yes, I think going back to the, the issue of counter speech, I think that would be very important. You know, not only political leadership, but clear campaigns, publicly funded campaigns of counter speech to really undermine the, the pseudo you know, um, scientific foundations of much of this hate speech, the, the, the flawed assumptions that underlie anti muslim anti-Chinese hate speech. Uh, uh, the state should play the key role, but also the federal state, the federal government, but also each individual state should play a key role. So publicly funded counter speech campaigns could be a good starting point, I think. Thanks, Matteo. Uh, Chin. Uh, how much time do I have, uh, Sharon? We uh, would uh, always give you all the time in the world, but just for yeah, now, what I are know, you I know. Uh, I've, got, I've got 25 things in my, in my basket, but I'll just pull out one, education. Uh, and not just formal education, but education right across. Um, it gets at the very foundation of, of racism prejudices. Now, I'm a lawyer by profession, and, and as a bureaucrat, we capture conduct and behavior, which is an expression of prejudice, because that's what we do. But I, I'm still uneasy in trying to tackle racism when, when we're saying to someone that you can't be a racist in a workplace, but it's, it's okay to be a racist at home. For me, it doesn't cut the master in the sense that we can deal with racism, we must deal with it in all its complexity as a total package about people's attitudes and education helps. And I've said this before, there is hope still because no child is born a racist. They got it somewhere and they can unlearn it. And we need to educate our people so that they don't get to that point of being racist. And of course, Kath. Um, well, yes, all, everything everyone said is absolutely wonderful. Um, I would add, uh, find a way to talk about racism in public discourse that moves people forward constructively and where people don't immediately get their backs up as though it's a personal attack. 
because we all live in a racist society. That's just a reality. We all live in a racist society. So we need to be able to talk about that without people just immediately getting defensive and instead being able to see that this is a systemic problem that affects all of us, it affects allies, it affects community, target communities, it affects all of us. Thanks, Kath. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious there are questions that have gone unanswered. The team will come back and answer those questions following the close of the webinar today. I have so enjoyed uh, hearing from our panellists and hearing um, from our audience in terms of their questions and of their comments. So let me thank all of our audience for their engagement. It's been really fantastic to have you throughout the duration of this webinar. I'd like to offer a very warm thanks uh, to Matteo, Kath, Chin, Viv and Erin uh, for being our panellists today. I think they have been truly uh, fabulous. I want to uh, give a shout out to the Monash Migration and Inclusion Centre and the unstinting work of Beck and Chloe and Kieran that have made uh, today possible and make so much about all the great work of the centre uh, possible and its reach. Um, in a time of isolation um, that we are living in, and here in Victoria, we are really living in a time of isolation uh, right now, hate speech not only debilitates, uh, it further isolates us from one another at precisely the time we need every force working in the opposite uh, direction. It fosters a climate of hatred and of fear, and that has a whole range of tangible and intangible consequences that we just can't wash clean when the pandemic is over. What happens during this pandemic will stay with us because as many of us are aware, there's no normal that we are returning to. Right now, we are reinventing ourselves, our communities, our institutions and our ways of living. And therefore what we carry into our transformed state will be very much inflected by our experiences uh, during this time. We have to ensure racism is not one of the experiences that we carry forward. We have to find ways to better leave it behind. All of you make outstanding contributions to doing just that. So let me thank you for your tireless work at a time when so many just wanna shut down and and retreat uh, that you continue to step forward on this issue and on so many others. So on behalf, on behalf of Monash University, of the Centre and of everyone involved with today, I wish you all um, great uh, happiness, health and success as you go forward with your good works. Thanks so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Bye-bye.